Our next discussion is titled Housing Policy, School Policy. Please welcome moderator Nadia Chinoy Dabi, Assistant Deputy Secretary for Innovation and Improvement, U.S. Department of Education. Good morning. We're going to try that again. Good morning. There we go. Good to be here, and thanks for having me. Um, I am here in short. I'm going to make a couple of quick opening remarks and then introduce the panel. Um, I'm here quite simply because housing matters to children's educational outcomes. Um, and I want to note that community planning and redevelopment efforts are often undertaken without consideration of their direct and indirect impacts on the quality of local schools. And education reforms, for which my department is responsible for quite a few of those, are rarely connected to neighborhood revitalization initiatives. And there are, of course, a few notable exceptions. We'll be talking a little bit about what's been happening in Tacoma, Washington, which I think you'll find pretty interesting. And at the federal level, as Secretary Castro was just referencing, we have made some significant strides. Um, for example, the department that I, the division that I oversee houses both the Promise Neighborhoods Program as well as the Promise Zones Initiative. Secretary Castro also mentioned the Choice Neighborhoods Program at HUD as well as a host of others. But by and large, as housers and education folks, we have different funding streams, different legal and regulatory parameters, different leaders, and therefore a pretty high likelihood of misalignment. Um, and this is a problem, because this can lead to confusion for the families that we are all committed to serve, and ultimately, it means that the outcomes that we care most about for those families and those children, um, we, lose tra we lose traction on, getting towards, on making progress towards some of those outcomes because of our siloed approach. I think there's a real question about what some of those outcomes should be, and I think our panel will discuss those um, in a little bit more detail. Are those outcomes like housing stability? Are those outcomes like school attendance? Are those outcomes like parent engagement? We can talk about what those should be, could be. Um, but I think at the end of the day, there's a really important role for policymakers to play, particularly as we now know that housing choice and school choice are not enough to eliminate high poverty neighborhoods and schools. At this time, I'm going to bring up our panel to discuss a few of these issues in greater depth. I'm going to introduce them all and then have them sit up here because it's a little awkward to have one person come up one by one. The first person I'd like to introduce is Jean-Claude Brizard, who's the president of Upspring Education Group. Ms. Sherry Keels, who's the associate professor at the Department of Comparative Human Development at the University of Chicago. Michael Mira, who's the executive director at the Tacoma Housing Authority. And Barbara Sard, who's the vice president for housing policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Good morning. Good morning. And before we start, can I ask that we queue up the video that we have about some of the recent efforts in Tacoma? When my daughter started school here, we didn't even own a pair of tennis shoes, and um, we didn't really hardly have any clothes, or we didn't have any furniture when we moved there. But we've accomplished a lot in the last year that I've been in this program. Tacoma Housing Authority is interested in education for reasons that derive directly from how we understand our job. McCarver is a very important elementary school in Tacoma, and it's in a lovely building on the hilltop, which is the city's lowest income neighborhood. Its population of students is among the lowest in the region, possibly the state. It has the most homeless students in the region, possibly the state. It has all the miserable outcomes we've somehow come to expect and accept from a school with those challenges. So our education project is really an experiment on how do you spend a housing dollar to get two other outcomes, help the children we house succeed in school help the schools that serve our communities succeed. Before I was in the program, like, um, we struggled a lot financially. Because all my money, like after I would pay rent, I'd only have like $40 in cash to last me the month. My kids missed a lot of school, and my son, he has autism, so I missed a lot of appointments and everything. I was very unaccountable as a parent still breaks my heart to these days. Um, when my daughter started school here, she didn't know how to do nothing. 
that a typical kindergarten should know when they enter kindergarten. She went from having to be in a read to me program where she would be tutored to where she's a little above average in reading now. And um, she is very, very good in math now. It's done a lot for me and my kids. My kids are doing so well in school. And fortunately, my son gets to come here next year because he's done immaculate with everything, was having that stability and being um, a productive parent. They taught me how to be involved and be a better parent. I didn't know how to be a parent because most of my life I was on drugs. And now I'm the mom that I never thought I could be. So I want to start by helping ground us in the research about what we know um, about the connection between these two things. But first, I just want to remind you as our audience um, that we will conclude this session with um, a portion of, question, of Q and A, um, and encourage you all to tweet your questions at us. You can also, of course, come up to the microphone later, but to get ready um, for that. And if you didn't hear the hashtag er earlier, it's HHMConf, so How Housing Matters as an acronym, and then C-O-N-F as in conference. Um, so, Michelle, I wonder if you can kick us off um, and tell us about what we know about the correlation between housing and schooling outcomes for families and schools in areas of concentrated poverty. Sure. So, my uh, translation of a few key research points is based on the idea that housing is not a unit of something that's consumed, but the idea that housing structures children's developmental and environmental exposures to many things that make it easy, either easier or harder for them to learn in school. And my translation of these research findings is also based on the understanding that homes and schools are interconnected place-based assets um, and that educational agencies and housing authority cooperation on a few key targeted outcomes can really create long -term, their long-term mutual interests of making sure that kids have the educational success that they need so that adult, as adults, they will be more self-sufficient and therefore less in need of housing agency resources. So the investments made by the housing agencies and schools early will pay off long-term um, for the next generation. And I wanna uh, first make the point that I think we all know by now that um, concentration of poverty in our neighborhoods has increased since the 1970s, so that we have really convincing evidence that our neighborhoods now are more concentrated with regards to poverty than they were in 1970. And the other thing that we now have is that kids in schools are more concentrated poverty-wise now than they were in the 1970s. So those numbers are not going in the right direction for thinking about and understanding how, what we know about how concentrated poverty affects the challenges that schools have to overcome. And just to give you a little note on what that is, and also make the point that um, this increasing school economic segregation is of particular importance to black and Latino students. Um, just over the past 10 years, we went from a situation where the average black and Latino student was in a school that was 50% low income to the situation today where the average black and Latino student is in a school where their peers are 75% low income. And so it's just compounding the challenges that schools have to get over before being able to turn to the issue of education. The other note is that this school segregation of um, economic resources spiked after the 2008 um, economic recession. And one aspect of thinking about how this post-recession spike, post-recession spike affected um, the concentration of schools is that it makes us think about maybe we were concentrating the most vulnerable families in a certain um, segment of our schools, which means that when there's a recession or economic downturn, those schools are more likely to experience challenges 
so that they're already burdened, but they also don't have enough buffers to help them whenever a recession happens that affects the whole country. Um, so that's kind of a couple of things to think about, that we're going in the wrong direction, and that this direction makes those schools increasingly vulnerable to anything that might happen in the future by not having a buffer of an economically diverse population of students. Um, so one note about that, so it's kind of like a problem, and then trying to also provide a note on some things that we know that may work to help resolve some of that um, economic concentration of students, and that's that there are a few school districts, unfortunately they only cover 3% of all students in public schools, but there are some school districts that are using an economic diversity index in terms of um, managing their student assignment policies or the way um, choice schools may operate so that no school is either particularly advantaged with regards to the socioeconomic population of its students or disadvantaged. So that at least within a school district, there are policies and actions that they can take to make sure that that student population burden and resource are distributed. Um, with regards to that. The other thing that I want to do to make sure that, um, to get the point across about how interconnected our schools and our neighborhoods and our housing is, is just to show a brief conceptual model. And so, this is just a simple cycle that we're just gonna start for this point, because we have to pick a point in time, of housing stability. And so thinking about high poverty neighborhoods, they have the highest rates of housing instability and housing insecurity for kids. And we can think of this cycle happening at the individual level of the child and family, but also at the neighborhood level. So at an individual child, when they're experiencing housing instability, they're also gonna be more likely to experience school instability which affects their ability to make supportive social networks in the school. So learning is a social process, and their ability to connect with teachers gets disrupted when they have to change schools. And it's also the case that teachers, if they're changing schools, don't have the information from other teachers about things that they can do for this student that, they, that they're getting into their classroom. We know that these factors increase the likelihood of juvenile crime, which affects educational attainment, and then adult poverty, and the cycle continues into the next generation. So it's just one model of thinking about that intergenerational cycle of poverty. And then it's complicated by the fact that there are lots of feedback loops that work through academic achievement, and which is why it's so important for a housing authority and a school district to work together, because they have the same goals um, by meeting the needs of housing stability and school stability. And also I wanna just highlight the loops that go back and forth from juvenile crime. Because it's really a corrosive cycle that can happen in there to really have things spiral out of control. And then finally, it just gets really messy. And this is just to note that all of these cycles and things that are happening at the child level and at the neighborhood level have all kinds of additional spillover effects into, as the video showed, parenting quality. Um, it's also the case with school stability. The individual kids that are unstable moving from school to school also affect the other kids in a school that are stable in that school. So it doesn't just affect those kids, but it affects everybody's ability to learn and has broader effects onto neighborhood social capital and things like that. So it's a, by being able to stabilize kids in schools and in neighborhoods and in housing, we can affect uh, reduce many negative feedback loops. And that's just a really brief overview. There are many other things that affect this system, but that's just one of them to show just how many things are spiraled out from the cycle. Thank you. Um, Barbara, your organization just released a paper this morning that looks at this connection between housing um, and other outcomes and focuses in particular on the education question. So I wonder if you can tell us sort of what can housing, age, housing authorities do to address this important issue? Well, I think that a lot of uh, very poor kids have, live in families that have housing vouchers, and those families live in areas where the schools don't do well. And that 
presents the opportunity to consider a moving strategy as to improve educational outcomes. Uh, just a few numbers, uh, nearly a quarter of a million children received housing vouchers in 2010 and lived in the poorest communities, those uh, where poverty rates are higher than 40 percent. These communities are often unsafe. As Ms. Ari explained, the lots of churning in the schools and they don't do well on tests. This is not an isolated problem. It's present in every state in the continental United States. Uh, and uh, a study by Ingrid Ellen and others has shown that uh, three quarters of the families uh, with children that get housing voucher assistance attend poorly or, or live near, nearest to poorly performing schools. So from a policy perspective, uh, the key point I want you to take away is that we can do something about this. Uh, that housing authorities themselves, but particularly the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, can make policy changes that can make a big difference in promoting uh, and helping families move to areas with better schools without action by Congress and without spending more money. So for example, housing authorities that administer uh, the Housing Choice Voucher Program and their kids uh, are in poorly performing schools, in addition to trying to achieve school stability, uh, can focus on uh, reminding families that they have a right to move uh, to other communities with their voucher. And there are a number of key things they can do to make those moves possible. Uh, they can set uh, the voucher payment standards, the maximum rent that a, or the maximum subsidy that a voucher will pay, high enough so that it enables families to live in areas with good schools that usually have higher rents. And they can lower the payment standards in areas with lower rents and poorly performing schools to offset uh, those higher costs so it's not a net cost increase. They can recruit landlords to participate uh, in the voucher program that have units in these better areas. They can allow families more time to search because it's usually harder to find units in areas with good schools. And they can collaborate with agencies in the metro area uh, so that it's easier for families to move to better schools. But the important thing here is there's nothing new about anything I just said. Um, housing authorities have, have, have had the ability to do these things for a long time. And for the most part, they haven't done them. So the key point here is that HUD needs to change its policies to make it more likely that agencies will take the steps uh, to make these moves more likely. The first is that HUD can create strong incentives for agencies to modify their policies. HUD can give more weight to location outcomes in assessing agency performance. HUD can clarify the obligations of agencies to affirmatively further fair housing by helping uh, families move out of high poverty, racially concentrated areas uh, to more diverse communities with better schools. And they can reward agencies that achieve these results with higher administrative fees. But HUD can also change some of its detailed policies to make it easier for uh, or more likely that agencies will adopt uh, local policies that work. Um, HUD sets what's called fair market rents, which are the benchmark for how much vouchers can pay. If HUD sets these standards based on smaller geographic areas like zip codes, instead of for the entire metropolitan area, the voucher payments will be higher in areas where there's more demand, which is likely to be driven in large part by good schools, and set them lower in areas uh, with poor schools. Uh, and, and this is particularly important in metro areas where a large share of vouchers are used in extremely poor racially concentrated neighborhoods. Um, HUD can also require, rather than just permit agencies, to include listings of units in low poverty, non-racially concentrated areas with good schools and to extend 
the search time uh, that families are allowed to find units in those areas. Terrific. And Michael, we saw an incredibly powerful video earlier about some of the work underway in Tacoma. So tell us a little bit more about what your work is and how you got there and what's been happening. The Tacoma Housing Authority is in its fifth or sixth year of something we call the Education Project. And we are interested in education for three reasons. The first derives directly from how we understand our mission. This is the most important of the reasons because education work requires long-term efforts and to make it plausible, the organization needs a stamina and a stability to undertake it. And if you don't have that for the journey, don't go. And so you need to knit it into the organization's mission statement. And we understand our job in this way. The guts of our work is to provide high quality housing to people who need it with a focus on the neediest. And we do that in two main ways. We build, buy, and rebuild housing and then rent it. And then we help families pay the rent on somebody else's housing. And that's, that's the main part of our job. And that's hard work. I don't count that as the hardest part of our job because the world knows how to house people when it wants to. The world knows how to build rebuild, rent, manage housing. The world knows how to run rental assistance programs. We don't know nearly enough about the next part of our job, which is how do you do that in a way that gets two other things done? Helps the families we house prosper. So their time with us is transforming and temporary. And as our mission statement says, we want them to succeed, not just as tenants, but as parents, students, wage earners, and builders of assets. Certainly for the parents, but emphatically for the children, because we don't wish them to need our housing when they grow up. And second, how do you do this work in a way that helps our communities develop so that low-income families experience them as places, our mission statement describes, as safe, vibrant, prosperous, attractive, and just. And the world doesn't know how to do that quite as well. And um, we mean to find it out. The second reason we're interested in education is we are real estate and community developers. And we develop communities, some of them large, that will not succeed financially or socially unless the schools that serve them succeed. The third reason is at Tacoma Housing Authority, we've made the judgment that the school district needs help. The school district has made this judgment. That children who grow up in deep poverty bring challenges to the schoolhouse door that the best trained teacher with the fanciest classroom cannot overcome on their own. So as you heard me explain in that short film, we're in this experiment. And how do you spend a housing dollar, not just to house someone, but to get two other outcomes? Help the children we house succeed in school and help the schools that serve low-income children succeed. And I'll ask you to note those are two different outcomes. And um, we start this experiment with a surmise that we are situated to be influential. And that surmise arises from some facts that are probably true for every housing authority in the nation. The fact number one, in Tacoma, except for the school district and the public assistance office, Nobody serves more poor children than the Tacoma Housing Authority. We house or help to house one out of every seven enrolled public school student. We house or help to house one out of every 4.5 low-income public school student. Fact number two, in serving them, we're deep into their lives. Whether landlord, 
We manage a very valuable rental subsidy for them. We monitor their compliance with these exquisitely detailed federal regulations. <laughs> we, provide supportive, we provide supportive services. <clears throat> so this gives us influence over their behavior and choices. Fact number three. We own large properties and manage them, and we spend lots of money in town, and that gives us influence over the behavior and choices of institutions, like the school district. Our education project has a number of elements to them, and our McCarver Elementary School housing program and its companion that we started this month with the local Tacoma Community College um, is an example of many. Thank you. And Jean-Claude, as the former <coughs> superintendent of the nation's uh, third largest school district in Chicago and as an advisor to a host of education initiatives at this point, um, what have you seen to be most effective to link these two worlds and why? So let me, let me first um, go back to one thing that Michael said. Um, the fact that we serve the poorest kids in, 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 mo in, most, in most cities. When I was in Chicago, Charles Woodyard, who was at the time the head of the housing authority, when he was appointed, came to me and said, my kids are your kids. Can we have coffee? Uh, and we begin to work in five ways to work together to actually make things happen. But go back to your question, and not to sort of skirt around your question, the, the, the exemplars are few and far in between, frankly. Um, and that's one big problem. We, we don't have many to talk about. Second is that we don't, also don't have a way of codifying or identifying those exemplars for, for folks to know what's happening across, across the country. The one thing I am seeing, though, is a, is a recognition amongst educators, and, and especially folks in the education sector, that housing is important, that the work we do around schools is important for student achievement. Um, a number of cities, Denver, um, D.C. in 2012, Chicago in 2004, 2008, with the help of IFF, um, uh, Illinois um, Facilities Fund, uh, developed these, these studies to look at the spread of quality schools across communities. Uh, and of course, what they found was that the, the worst schools tend to be in the poorest communities. But what's interesting, and I'll, I'll use this as an example, is that although we've been pushing choice as, as a way to get these heterogeneous groupings across, across, across our cities to support parents in accessing the best charter or uh, charter public or, or district public schools, what is being recognized is the fact that most parents tend to go to the school on the corner. Uh, in DC, for, for instance, in 2012, IFF found that three quarters of all DCPS students tend to go to the school in the neighborhood or the neighborhood boundary. So although we, we push that a, a child's education should not be tied to a zip code, the fact is it is. It is what people are doing. The school of choice often is the school on the corner. So, Choice is important. I'm a big believer in choice. But how do you then begin to make this one corner work for, for parents and, 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 and for students, given the fact that they're not going to go? So a few examples. When I was in Rochester, New York, uh, and in New York City, one thing that's wonderful about the state of New York is attaching transportation reimbursement for parents to choose to send their kids outside of a boundary. So two miles was the reimbursement. As a district, we, we paid or, or chose students for transportation who live a mile and a half from the school. So if you think about Rochester, New York, if you know uh, where that is, and the amount of snow the city gets every single year, a mile and a half of walking with a se six or seven year old uh, is not exactly convenient or accessible, even though it's a wonderful policy. Um, Illinois has no such reimbursement policies. Um, in fact, the city of Chicago doesn't even provide free transportation to, to, to general students. I believe they have to pay a dollar each way if they choose to go. If you're a poor parent, you're not going to access a school that's six, seven miles away from your school. So the idea of looking at um, how we provide choice and everything else we have to do around choice has to be part of the conversation. And more and more I'm watching, talking to superintendents who are beginning to understand that, reaching out to communities, reaching out to um, transportation and, and the city's infrastructure to push these kinds of conversation. One of the things I'm most excited about is this new organization called Ed Build, a uh, woman named Rebecca Sibilia, who's begun this 501c3, uh, to look at using the school as an anchor for community revitalization. Uh, 
So looking at finance, looking at state policies, local policies, um, and I'm sure, of course, looking at housing, how you can even incentivize teachers who are working in a school to live in the same community as parents and students. Because we know if we can find ways of stabilizing um, those, those, those kinds of environments, the, the, the issues of attachment, sense of belonging, have direct implications for student achievement. So how you make that happen in a community, I think, is becoming more and more prevalent amongst at least education reformers and educators. Uh, crossing the divide to talk about housing, talking to transportation, I think, is becoming, has become more and more the, uh, the challenge for a lot of us in this, in this work. So I want to push a little on this question around choice, because I think there's a, a few things that get wrapped up in there. Um, so I'll lob a couple things out and send them directionally, and you can adjust accordingly. So I, one, I would actually push us, and interested in your perspective on this question in particular, Jean-Claude, on the question of um, when we sort of say to a parent, hey, we want your kid to do better, here's a choice for you to go somewhere else, for you to physically move, for you to send your kid somewhere else. There's a kind of philosophical question around that. In some way, the message that, that we risk sending in that context is sort of your sort of too many of kids like yours and when school creates a problem. Um, and that's a sort of philosophical frame that I think it's worth us wrestling a little bit with. So I think there's one part of the question which is sort of what do we make of that message um, of sort of saying, hey, you move um, and that's how we'll solve your problem. And then empirically, I think, Michelle, you've done some research on this question around um, looking at a few different examples of when we give parents incentives to move um, to different neighborhoods, what actually happens um, to their students' outcomes. You know, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. And frankly, one I've, I've had issue and difficulties with that. Um, again, I'm not anti-choice. I'm a big, big proponent of choice. But to convince people to go elsewhere, that you can't stay here because it will never work, I think is in part problematic. Because very often, in many communities, it's the church and the school that are anchors to that particular community. And you've got to build both to, to, to address the issue. But for a long time, I think this current crop of reformers We've been, and I consider myself one of them, we've been sort of looking at this, this issue in a bifurcated way. Do you fix poverty first or do you speak, fix education first? And we all know it's both at the same time. And you can't do one or the other. But we also know that there are ways of building what uh, Pam Cantor at Turning Out for Children refers to as fortified learning environments. So can you begin to address the other issues within the school to mitigate the impact of poverty, the stresses of poverty on learning, do you train teachers, leaders, et cetera, to do this? And to channel my wife for a second, who happens to be a cognitive psychologist, who talks about the fact that you can develop these frameworks to begin to build the resilience, the academic resilience of kids by looking at attachment, sense of belonging, uh, executive function, the thing, th things we've often found missing in, in, in middle school, upper elementary, and high schools across, across our schools. Um, and the fact is we don't know how to do that really well. We do it well perhaps in special ed sometimes, in early education. We don't do it in the rest of the work. The fact is you can mitigate the impact. You can build these environments to support children's learning to change the school. And, and she argues that is the achievement gap. Uh, if we begin to address a lot of this within schools, yes, it is easier in a heterogeneous environment. It is much easier. Uh, but we can find ways of providing those kinds of support for schools so they can succeed. Part of the problem is that we often refer to these ki that kind of work as soft skills, non-cognitive work. Nothing about that is soft, and nothing about is it non-cognitive. It's all cognition. So how we begin to build an environment for learning, yes, offer the choice, but yes, at the same time, provide supports that teachers need, that principals need, to build the kind of schools we know our kids deserve in those kinds of communities. Because again, going back to DC, if you look at east of the Anacostia River, those parents who live there are going to keep their schools in that community. Uh, and I, and I, right now I'm doing some work in D.C., and I live in Northwest D.C., and I see the difference between my child's DCPS school and what I'm seeing on the parts of the city. And you can fix it. The question is, are we willing to actually make it happen? It's also the case that the focus on what to do with schools located in high poverty neighborhoods um, now rather than, while also, as you said, allowing choice and um, allowing parents the space to make decisions um, other than just restricted to the neighborhood school, so choice is a good thing in theory. Um, one of the problems is how it plays out in practice. Um, as Nadia said, um, 
there are certain assumptions and philosophical underpinnings about choice. The, the two, and I put the neighborhood choice um, with housing choice vouchers, um, is kind of what I see as like the housing authority way, and the school choice with regards to either charter schools or um, vouchers or other open boundary schools as a school's uh, way of choice. Both of them we're beginning to see have strong limitations. One, transportation is huge, particularly for low-income families. And other middle-income families that may need to get to a job that's far away. So which is why you see all of these, even though choice is accessible, um, more closer to home, neighborhood-based um, choices that are made. The other is that if we look at just moving people, uh, that the whole, the whole graph that I made about housing stability, it affects kids. If you move kids from one neighborhood to another one, particularly if you're moving low-income kids into a middle or high-income neighborhood, yes, it does put them in the place of higher resources, but we have not figured out whether we've prepared those kids to be able to access those higher resources. Have we scaffolded their ability to transition from one school to another? They may have been in a school that was teaching them at one particular curricular level, and then we suddenly move them through choice to another school that's teaching at a different higher curricular level, but we have not done anything to improve the child's ability to access that high curricular level. It's also the case that we have, that there's studies showing that higher, uh, schools with higher achievement levels may not be prepared to support the needs of disadvantaged students. So we've had students who move from high poverty neighborhoods to a very low poverty neighborhood, but now there's no free lunch or any sorts of other food supports at those schools. And so those kids are now at a disadvantage because their household resources didn't change, but now in, they have less of those supplementary resources at these new higher um, income schools. So we have not necessarily thought through all that happens when we just change a neighborhood without necessarily providing the families and the kids with the resources that they need to access those stronger resources. So the need for a place-based meeting kids' needs where they are are so strong. Um, so, I agree with, with what you've said, but I, I think it's important for people to understand that there's also research uh, that shows that uh, public housing kids who attend low poverty schools and do so for a long time so they achieve stability, yes. uh, do very well, and really make dramatic progress in closing the gap uh, that otherwise exists based on uh, income and to some extent race and ethnicity. Uh, so this is a study in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, nearby, uh, by Heather Schwartz from the Rand Corporation. And we talk about it a lot in our paper and, and show the results because uh, a, it was a very rigorous study, and uh, importantly, the big gains for kids when the graph lines really go up is in years five to seven. So after they've been in those schools yes. and in those districts right. for five to seven years. Right. And also, so it's, it's the idea of taking that information and then having housing authorities think about who is best able to benefit from those types of changes. So that works great with families with younger kids to make those kinds of moves. Not so much with families of teenagers when you're suddenly shifting their environments. And so thinking about all of those things in the way that resources are offered are structured so that kids can benefit from them. And Michael, you thought about a very specific population in your work. This question was a very important one as the Tacoma Housing Authority and the Tacoma School District designed the McCarver program. The traditional housing strategy to intervene into a failing school like that is indeed to give vouch housing vouchers to parents so they can escape and go find themselves a better school. And the data is mixed on what outcomes you get as a result or whether they would indeed move at all. And we could have done that. And we could have given 50 vouchers to families and assumed that they escaped and went, went off to another school. 
but they would have been replaced by another 50 families from the shelter, and nothing would have changed at McCarver. And here, I'll ask you to understand that our intervention is focused as much on the school as it is on the individual families. Now, the companion element in the McCarver program is to invest in the school. And the investments took several types. Um, the main contribution, I think, is we brought the mobility rate down in that school. Because the data is pretty clear that mobility rates, McCarver had 179% mobility rate. It's like teaching class in the waiting area of a bus depot. Um, is ruinous to the school outcomes of the children who come and go and their classmates who have to sit there and watch it happen. We also asked the school district to invest in the school. We have a very good school district. Um, but we started this at a time when they were cutting tens of millions of dollars out of their budget. But they stepped up and invested in some notable ways, and I'll mention just one. The time and money it took to turn that school into something called an international baccalaureate primary year program, which raises academic standards for the whole school, both faculty and st students. And um, so this is, this is a, a different use of a housing dollar. We spend most of our housing dollars in the way that Barbara was describing, with choice that parents have to take it into the private rental market and find their own housing. But this is something new we're trying and we're learning a lot. And we are um, about a month away from having three years worth of data. We've, we have two years worth of data with a third party evaluator paid for by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it's been, it's been positive. The turnover rate of that school is down to 75%. Still pretty high, but lower than anyone can remember. The reading scores of the cohort children have risen 22%, three times faster than comparable cohorts. 61% um, of the cohort children are reading on grade level now. And the earned income of the participating families has doubled. Still not enough, but very positive. The preliminary third year data shows that they've retained all those gains. And come Halloween, Tacoma Housing Authority and the school district will start deciding what this data tells us about expanding to the other elementary schools in Tacoma with ruinous turnover rates attributable to homelessness and housing instability. And I think we're headed in that direction and we'll learn more when we do it. So, Michael and John Claude, you've both talked in some way about how doing this work is a little bit lonely, right? That there's not a lot of folks kind of jumping up into this space. And so I wonder from your perspectives, what are the sort of, what's the, Michael, from you, what are the elements of your partnership with the school district? What has helped make that successful? Um, and are there other players? Um, so Jean-Claude mentioned some of the, you know, some yeah. other kinds of supports that can be helpful um, for the families you're working with. So kind of wonder what that looks like from your end. It's a good question. Um, first, I'm not feeling too lonely. Uh, got all these people here. <laughs> um, and in fact, the Council of Large Public Housing Authorities and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is hosting a conference at the end of February on this very question. Um, but this is what I think to be the elements of a successful partnership with the school district. And the first is the one I've already mentioned that both organizations have to knit this into their mission and recognize, as Jean-Claude did in Chicago, that we serve the same children. Second, um, there needs to be a very strong agreement on the exchange of data. THA responds well to data, and we need it to make these policy and design choices. And this is not easy. For a school district and a housing authority, each governed by laws to exchange data 
like the National Security Agency exchanging data with the KGB. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard. Um, and you can't let your lawyers push you around too much. The third thing from the Housing Authority's point of view is it needs the regulatory flexibility to get this done. And in Tacoma, that means the moving to work status that HUD has conferred on us. That is essential to give us the maneuvering room to make these judgments and to respond to the data. And from the school district side, I think it needs strong support from its teacher staff to invite a housing authority into the school. When we started this journey, um, there were a lot of meetings where we had to explain, so why is a housing authority at this discussion about education? And we're way past that, but you do have to get over it. And um, one way we got over it, I think, was even before we started this, but we're planning in the school, the faculty responded in ways that um, were revealing to me. It is not easy to be a public school teacher these days. It is not easy to teach in a school like McCarver. And they were gratified that someone was showing up rooting for them. It was odd that it was a public housing authority, but they adjusted. <laughs> Um, and it was, I think, helpful that we were not only rooting for them, but bringing resources. And here's the key. The main expense of this kind of program are the housing dollars. I don't count that as a cost. We would be spending those housing dollars housing somebody. Remember, the challenge is how do you spend a housing dollar not just to house someone, but to get these other outcomes? And once you've settled on that insight, this thing becomes expandable to scale. You know, what's, what's important, I think, to listening to Michael um, is that he went to talk about the teaching staff, not necessarily the superintendent. Uh, one question I asked Michael last night was, how many transitions have you been through in terms of leadership at the district level? So far, one, uh, one to a second. My worry uh, often has to do with if you have a key protagonist at the top chair who's a believer and understands the importance, once that person leaves, then what happens to the partnership in the program? So big believer in mutualism or symbiosis, whatever you want to call it, when both organisms really understand the benefit of working together, that kind of stuff tends to sustain much, much longer. Um, I'll tell you that educators that know the difficulties that they, that they are experiencing when they have a concentration of, of poorly prepared kids at home and in school and the work that they have to do. When you show up and say, this is what this can do, this is the research behind it, and this is how we're gonna support you in making this happen, people are all ears. And once you permeate the organization, I think, you have sustainability. So no matter what happens to the chair, the top person leaves or goes, once you have this kind of organic partnership, I think you're going to be around for a long time. Yeah. So just a reminder to you, our friends in the audience, to think about your questions. Um, but for now, Barbara, I wonder if you have a perspective on um, some risks that you actually might see in aligning this kind of work, as, a, as important as it may be. So let me say that I, I think that the Tacoma Initiative is um, exciting and provocative, and it it holds the potential to uh, really carry the message that if we don't do something about increasing the stability of where children live, all the resources that we pour into schools are kind of going down the drain. Uh, and so I see that as, as you know, very important in the bigger policy reform trajectory. But in the short run, <coughs> when you're, I, th I think Michael's point that he used the housing dollars as leverage to get investments from the schools, that's very important, not just a giveaway, but, but getting something. But still, if some of the housing, uh, of the dollars, the 
the Tacoma Housing Authority could have used to house additional families are going for some services and other things to make this project work. Uh, and I understand the short run trade-off, but that's a cost, that's a risk. That's fewer families getting housing stability, uh, getting the, the housing that they need at a time when needs are mounting. Uh, justified, I think, when tied to, to really rigorous research to see if it works, um, but important to do on a pilot, rigorously evaluated basis and not wholesale. Um, the other thing is to look at the children themselves. And this is always a challenge, but um, yes, the program in a few years has had a dramatic effect of reducing the turnover rate by more than half, but it's still 75%. And performance rates are up, but they're still not very good. So for particular children who only have one shot at elementary school, um, requiring them to stay in that school as a condition of getting their housing assistance could come at a real cost to them, uh, as opposed to allowing them to move. And I, I guess it, Im importantly, there are values at stake here. I'm someone who deeply believes in the principle of choice. Um, I don't think we should require families to live in low poverty areas. I also don't think we should require them to live in high poverty areas. You know, one, one thing though, going back to the school in Tacoma that I really love hearing was the fact that the effort is not just on the housing but also on the school itself. The fact that you're moving to an IB um, early years program shows that you are increasing rigor. My hope is that there is an effort to also elevate the quality of the teaching, the teachers, the leadership. It, it's not one or the other, it's an all the above situation. And I, I think if you create a really good elementary school, you won't have to convince, or you, you won't have to force people to stay. They'll want to stay in that kind of environment. So I think if you, if you at times use a school as the anchor, um, and yes, with everything else around it, you can create that kind of nucleus where you're gonna get people a more heterogeneous grouping of individuals who want to stay, thereby increasing the quality of the work happening in a particular school. Um, like I said, my, my four-year-old right now is at a school in Northwest DC, and no matter what would happen with accountability or support, or whatever you want to do in DC, the parents, there's a layer of accountability on teachers and the leader that we have on the school that doesn't have to be written. We expect excellence, we expect rigor, we are involved in that. So how do you bring that kind of replication uh, into a poor, a high poverty school, and frankly, by having a more heterogeneous population and parents who have more resilience who know how to work the system, you don't need all. You need a critical mass and you will push the school as well. But the focus on both, I think, is, is critical. You won't have to force people if you have a quality school for, for parents. I'm gonna push a little bit on that. So I think, I think it's right and appropriate to say to do both, but we also live in a world of finite resources, right? Um, we are here because we think both matter. Let's be very clear about that. Um, but the question is sort of both, in some way, both for whom, right? So we can't actually do all of these things all at once for everyone at scale in ways that sort of get us to the outcomes that we seek. And I think that's a little bit what you're pointing out, Barbara, right? Is that the, there's inevitably some tension um, in that. And so I, there's, and in some way, part of the, your point, I think, is an inevitable kind of policymaker conundrum of are you trying to think about moving a, you know, sort of a larger group a smaller distance or a smaller group a larger distance? Um, and there are real reasons to do both of those things and for, you know, in different contexts. And I, I wonder, Michelle, from your do you have a perspective from a kind of research standpoint um, or from kind of looking at this across the country about how to think about that question of sort of where to start and sort of who to move first in a universe of finite resources? Right. Um, the trade-offs are challenging. The trade-offs are a challenging one. Um, and we're thinking of the trade-offs being investing the dollars in housing versus and or in the schools associated themselves. Um, is that kind of 
so I will say, from a practical standpoint, I'm not sure that's, in the oh, near term, that's not sure that's actually the trade. So while it's true that those are both public dollars, I think it is also true that we live in a universe where those dollars are very segregated, right? Yes. And so you don't just get to lump all the money together and say, what's the best way to spend it on this host of outcomes? Yes. And maybe that should be the case, but that's sort of not the universe we're currently in. So I think we are in a universe where there are a set of resources that are dedicated to housing. There's a set of resources that are dedicated to education. There's some flexibility to think about how you align each of those individual pools of resources. Mm -hmm. um, but when we align them, I think the question is, we align them to do what and where and for whom? Yes. Um, in the longer term, I think there is obviously this larger question around, these are all different public resources. How do we think the sort of, what's the most efficacious way of spending those dollars? But So I'm actually going to skip your question. Uh, Clever. <laughs> it's actually because I don't have a good answer to that question of trade-offs and alignment given what we know, um, the and can I just add, like, there may be a better question, which is, what would we need to know to be able to think about some of those questions? Yes, um, one of those. So thinking about the turn to place-based um, initiatives, and to the idea that if we revitalize a school. Um, it'll be a magnet that will attract um, middle-income families into the neighborhood, and that will then hopefully improve the resources and things that are, that are in, the neighborhood, in the school that will benefit all families. There, if we're talking about potential risks in, associated with that strategy, while I am 100% for reducing poverty level in schools, and I am 100% for the idea that um, revitalizing neighborhoods and or gentrifying neighborhoods, depending on who you're talking to and how you want to call it, but improving the socioeconomic status of families in a neighborhood and decreasing the poverty level in a neighborhood is really, really important. And it's something that we should push towards continuing to do. Um, but there are two key risks associated with that that we need to keep in mind. One of them, I think, is somewhat um, mitigated by, by policies like No Child Left Behind with regards to data tracking, with, with regards to not just looking at an average level of a school and looking at what happens to subgroups within a school. So it is possible to increase the achievement level to have a school look like it's doing well. Um, but that's mainly because of the higher income families in a school. So it is possible to reduce the economic segregation within a school, and then the school looks like it's doing better, but the original poor families and poor kids in that school are not doing any better um, because of within school tracking and things like that that happen. So it's great to economically diversify a school, but then it's also really important to keep an eye on what's happening with the low-income kids that stay in that school to make sure that they continue to get access to the resources of that school. And so, uh, as one researcher has said that it's good to economically diversify a school with the goal of having it benefit the low-income kids that stay in that school and to not take your eye off that goal so that they don't get tracked into the lower um, curricular quality offerings. The other aspect about kind of market-based solutions of revitalizing neighborhoods as a way to improve um, high poverty schools, just to, to kind of like the researcher in me needs to take you to a place to see what can happen with that. Um, and to that, I'll just take you to a place in Chicago that has changed dramatically from 1990 to 2010 with regards to the, um, the slide, with regards to everything that we say should happen in terms of the poverty level, which is the, the third row down, which is the percent of families in the neighborhoods that are 200% or more um, of the poverty line. And so, they have increased the goal of um, reducing the level of racial segregation in the neighborhood, and they have achieved the goal of increasing the socioeconomic status of the residents in the neighborhood. Uh, but then you have to look at the bottom two rows, which shows how 
the fraction of children in the neighborhood has changed. And this has changed for one big reason is that the quality of the neighborhood schools that were there that families thought of as being um, beneficial or places where they would send their kids. So as you said, Chicago has pushed a lot towards choice, but families want schools that are in their neighborhood for their kids. And so as the neighborhood has changed socioeconomically, it's not really pulling in a lot of middle-income families with kids um, into the neighborhood because this revitalization was, revitalization was not tied to the quality of local schools where these families would be able to send their kids. So because that strategy was not done um, in the beginning, it's really affected who can be there to the extent where the developer of this neighborhood is now trying to figure out how do we build a school so that we can bring these families in. But, and today I, I talk about this neighborhood with a class that I teach at the university and some of the students were saying, wait, the developer of, um, the private developer of housing is trying to figure out how to build a public school? Um, is, what's wrong with the way that we've thought about this? And the other aspect of if it'll work. Is what has happened to the, uh, there it is, to the public school. So there were four public schools in this neighborhood back in 1998. There is now only one neighborhood public school left. It's John M. Smith Elementary School. It's is an IB World School, so they are doing everything to try to make themselves attractive to the middle-income families that are moving into this neighborhood. However, as you can see, the actual enrollment has declined. So, and the other three schools closed because of declining enrollment. So these were all neighborhood schools that were there, but have not at all benefit from the socioeconomic development that's happening in the community around them. In fact, they closed because of declining enrollment because parents that were moved in either didn't have, families either didn't have kids or they were sending their kids elsewhere. Um, and the one neighborhood school that's left has not changed in terms of its demographic composition. So it's just the idea that, in theory, the, a turn towards neighborhood revitalization should affect the neighborhood school, but unless it's actually going to be a part of direct policy, we don't have any evidence that it really happens. And so this is just one school, but it's based on data where I looked at all of the schools in Chicago and all of the neighborhoods in Chicago that we're revitalizing. And so it's just an idea that we have lots of things that we think will happen in theory, but we need to figure out whether and how to make them happen in practice. So I do want to open, I do want to open things up to, for, for Q&A, so if folks um, want to pop up when they're ready, that would be great. Michael. Um, I'd like to go back to the question you posed about trade-offs. Um, they are familiar questions to anyone in this business. Um, I don't see, though, it as a principal distinction between these various models. We are spending what could have been housing dollars on services, that's true, but um, you would do that, you would have the same trade-offs, for example, in Barber's model, where you would be spending more money on higher rental rates and higher income families and the services it takes to do effective mobility counseling. And if, you, if the highest value was housing the number of families and that's it, you wouldn't do any of that. And that's true for these place-based interventions as well. So the trade-offs by themselves are important. You have to consider them, but they're not necessarily the principle upon which to distinguish among the interventions. Barbara? So let me just clarify. I, I, I think um, for agencies, the, the all but 39 agencies who don't have the flexibility now to shift housing dollars to services, um, we acknowledge in the report that uh, for some of the additional uh, services like mobility counseling would have to be funded 
uh, probably not by the housing authorities. It would have to be funded by state or local governments or philanthropy. But I just want to underscore that even without uh, investments in those additional services, there is evidence that changing how much rent a voucher can cover in a neighborhood with better schools, you can offset the cost by reducing the amount you pay in lower cost areas. And so you don't have, uh, for trying to achieve better location outcomes for the more than a million families, nearly two million children who now have housing voucher assistance or will in the future, that we can achieve better location outcomes without spending more. That that one is not necessarily a resource trade-off. Just, just two, two points. One, uh, I guess, addressing two comments um, that were made. One, in looking at even the Chicago example of magnet and charter schools that have replaced closed schools, too often in cities across the country, uh, we may place a high-performing charter in a poor community, but they have a citywide draw and not, not have enough seats for the local community. I think having that, that policy balance and fix, I think, is important. Um, the second, going back to your question around school funding, and the Post had a really good article yesterday on, on how that's distributed across the country, how much money we spend on poor schools, et cetera, poor, poor um, kids in poor schools. Uh, the fact is that while the issue of, sort of funding and, and fiscal alignment, et cetera, is controversial naturally, uh, especially when you look at states and suburbs versus cities. But within school districts, I think a lot can be done to make sure that we know how money is being spent and who we're spending it on. Um, one thing that's being, been pushed for a long time is this issue of equitable student funding. And, and that, that policy push very simply says that uh, equity is not equal. Uh, how do you, where do you spend more or less depending on the, the kinds of kids you are serving, but a very deliberate approach to making sure that you are pushing resources to the kids who need it the best is, is, is critical, but controversial, uh, and can be done within a school district with people who have perhaps the courage to do it. Uh, problem is, what's dangerous about it is that, you know, it is a finite sum of money. Some will lose and some will gain. So often the folks who tend to lose, unfortunately, are the higher income families who tend to vote, who tend to get the board elected, et cetera. So, but there are places, um, Baltimore City, I think, was one under Alonzo. Seattle, many years ago, did it. Uh, we pushed it in Rochester. Um, New York City, I think, experimented with this as well. The idea of making sure you have this funding system that supports kids in different ways, I think, can be done within school districts. Question? Thanks for such a great panel. This has been really interesting, and I appreciate the inspiration of the Tacoma case. Um, I wanted to ask you and if you could be a, a favor and just sorry, introduce yourself. Heather Heckel from American University. I wanted to ask you if you could be a little bit more specific. I wanted to tell you the story of one of my students when I taught in middle school in IB. Twelve-year-old uh, Kyla has been in ten homes. She's been homeless for two years. She now lives in a public housing project, and she goes to a school with about a 98% poverty rate. Could you all give me one example of a policy of either the local housing authority or the national HUD that would help her lead a prosperous life? It's a small question. <laughs> so w one thing that um, we wanted to talk about and didn't get a chance to is, is uh, a responsive to your question. So. One of the policies that HUD has begun in the last few years is called the Rental Assistance Demonstration, and it allows housing authorities, um, there's a cap on the number of units now, but hopefully Congress will raise that cap. It, it allows housing authorities to change the funding source for their properties from the public housing funding stream uh, to the Section 8 funding stream, which sounds all very technical, but by just changing kind of the package, mm -hmm. it allows agencies to leverage private dollars uh, from low-income housing tax credits or from lenders to repair the properties, make them better places to live. That doesn't change the neighborhood. That doesn't change the poverty concentration in the school. Uh, but 
Importantly, as part of that shift in funding sources, HUD requires that housing authorities allow families after they've lived in the development for a year or two to move if they want to with a housing voucher uh, that becomes available when another family leaves the housing voucher program. So another family will move into that unit with the poor school. It's not a complete community solution, but if that school is really not doing well for that child, and if they wanted to move again, um, they would have an ability to do so. So uh, it not, a, not a perfect solution, obviously, but at least some um, opportunity for some kids who have never had that kind of choice before. Mike. We're about to, <clears throat> we're in planning stages for our largest public housing community called New Salishan to establish children's savings accounts for all the children of Salishan. We're doing this under the um, expert direction of CFED and other partners and look forward to some notable outcomes in the form of greater academic success and high school graduation. The companion effort to that was interesting. Um, in Washington State, we have something called the College Bound Scholarship. It's a very valuable promise the state legislature has made to every poor child in the state. If you graduate from high school with at least a 2.0 grade point average, stay out of serious trouble, and get yourself into a post-secondary program, the state will make sure tuition is affordable. Life-transforming promise. There's a catch. You have to sign up for it by the end of your eighth grade year. And when we started this, for lack of that miserable bit of paper shuffling, almost half the children were missing out. And when we realized that, we thought, well, paper shuffling, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and we resolved to sign up 100% of our eighth graders every year. And we got it done by taking the college-bound scholarship paper shuffle and putting it at the bottom of our paper shuffle, taking advantage of a law of nature, that the normal human person who has just signed four pieces of paper is probably willing to sign a fifth. <laughs> and this was a good experience for us. This was at the beginning of our education project, showing us that a housing authority is situated to be influential. And for the last four years, we've signed up 100% of our eighth graders. In, in something that will be very meaningful in their long-term prospects. And I can say that that will be hugely meaningful. The other work that I do looks at minority students in college. And one of the most heartbreaking thing was looking at freshman students that didn't make it through the first term because of a difference of about 200 or $300 that was not covered. And this meant that they left college without their first term, but with a debt. And so it was small amounts of money, but if you are coming from a poor family, that, those $200 or $300 meant the difference between staying or leaving college. And so those types of things will have huge long-term impacts. And we know that those types of investments need to make, be made early because um, kids need to, and families need to know that college will be covered in the future, that which allows them to make educational investments early when it matters. And from a school perspective, I mean, for me, it goes back to the idea of attachment, right? We know that has great, great outcomes. So who's the advocate in that school who's leaning on, on the housing folks to, to advocate for this child and to be the one who's consistently in this person's life year after year? and being the one screaming on the phone and saying, you can't move this child again. Uh, so if that young person has a, an adult in that school that he or she can go to on a regular basis and knows that person is gonna be that uh, advocate, I think you'll get that attachment, you'll get the longevity, you'll get the, the outcomes you're looking for. Yes, please. Good morning, Michael Bodak from the National Housing Trust. I have a quick comment and then a question for Michael. Uh, my comment is to Barbara, and you don't need to answer this, Barbara, but there's no question that the resource allocation as a math proposition by lowering voucher costs in certain areas and increasing the other is neutral. 
I think the policy prescription has some questions, especially when we're talking about choice for people who want to stay in those higher poverty areas for other reasons. And we know that that's the case. So I just think when we talk about this, when we talk about choice, my comment is to make sure that it's not just a mathematical proposition, but we talk about are there going to be outcomes for those families that we haven't anticipated when we reduce those voucher costs. We can talk about that separately. But Michael, I have a question that um, is very, in I find very interesting. I'm very interested in what you're doing. Have you thought about looking at higher performing schools in and around Tacoma and figuring out a way to use high, your housing choice vouchers as part of the capital stack of encouraging private developers to preserve already existing affordable housing near such schools. And the reason I bring that up is because we're looking at, the, the National Housing Trust is kind of looking at this uh, in Chicago and some other places and talking to the housing authority there. And it seems to us that there may be certain transactions when you take a, the great schools data and you overlap it with the sales prices of market rate properties and you start to introduce housing choice vouchers, if you get where I'm going, you can actually help people who want to live in those areas get to those schools and, and use your housing choice vouchers in that way. So just a question of whether you've considered it or others. Thank you. Um, we've considered it a lot. Um, I'll mention two efforts we are trying. Um, housing authorities have the ability to project base a tenant base voucher into a market rate building. And we have tried to do that, but with limited success with the market rate developers. Most of our project-based vouchers are with nonprofits. Second, we are now four years deep into an advocacy effort with our city to fashion an inclusionary zoning policy that would oblige private developers to knit affordable housing into the market rate mix, especially in those areas which are prospering because of public investment, like light rail. And how do you recapture some of that enhanced property values and redirect it into a public good like affordable housing? It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. I don't think it's impossible, and I would encourage you to think about it more. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Greg Ford, uh, a resident service coordinator with Beacon Communities. In many ways, property values drive the resources for public schools. And what I notice in Richmond, Virginia, is in our exclusive inner city communities, all of their, their kids go to private schools. So they don't invest in their own school systems within their neighborhood. And all of their neighborhood schools, the kids are bust in from low-income areas. How do we begin to have a conversation about getting this high-income resident population to be stakeholders in their own communities? So I would say ask me in a couple years, because in the neighborhood that we're looking at, what we're doing right now is that we are um, serving and interviewing those middle and upper income families to find out how they think about this last remaining neighborhood school and how they think about the other educational choices that they're making. So we know where they're not going. And so we're now asking them why they're going elsewhere, why they've made those choices. As part of figuring out, is there any way that that school can market itself differently or communicate itself differently that would have it um, seem like a viable option? The other thing that I've learned from just starting to be in this community and in the school is, I had said to um, Nadia previously that um, based on my research, high poverty schools like this would need to benefit from the support of higher income families that are not sending their kids to the school. So they're not sending their kids to the school, but maybe they could also be stakeholders by volunteering and supporting the schools in other ways. And we were discussing the fact that that's, again, something that the could theoretically happen, but doesn't really seem to happen. Um, I got a good lesson when I started going to the school and talking with one of the parent advocates about, well, you know, there are all of these middle-income families around you. Um, 
can we recruit them and get them into helping with the school? And I was really humbled and accepted her um, thoughts on the idea that it's hard for them to accept that help and support if you are simultaneously saying to us, your school is not good enough for our kids. So we're saying, I'm not willing to send my kids there, but I will come and intervene. And so that's, that's a tough relationship to bridge. Um, and so trying to figure out how these parents think about the school in ways that are causing them to make other decisions to find out if it's possible, if it's nothing, if the only thing that matters is a test score, a school that's 98% poor will never be able, it's gonna be challenging to achieve, get over a test score hump that would then allow those middle income families to say, okay, now you've got your test scores up high enough, now I'll send my kids there. So it's, I don't know how that chicken and egg works, but trying to understand that a little bit better. And, and it's to the point where the realtors will even list only the private schools as they market these homes. They don't yes. even list the public schools that's zoned for the schools. I would add there's a grand experiment happening right now in D.C. as D.C. gentrifies. You've got a lot of young folks moving or higher income people moving to poor communities, not yet having children. The question is, when will that tipping point happen in those communities where they begin to send their kids to those schools? They're they are busing their kids, those who have kids, other places, sometimes charters, etc. But the question of perception, the question of is that school good enough for my kids now, I think is one that's being debated. Um, but surveying parents, asking them what they want, what will convince you to come to this particular school, but then deliver on, on what you're offering and promising, I think, is part of the uh, uh, solution. It's, it's, it's a hard one. Um, because as a parent, I can tell you that I want to choose the best school for my kids. Um, and, and luckily, I have the means to choose private and public. My kids go to public schools. But I will find the best public school I can find and, and, and go there. I think every parent wants the same thing. So if you build it, I think you'll begin to get people there. But you have to change the perception of what has existed in a long time. But I would argue DC right now is a great sort of a, a petri dish to see what's going to happen in the next few years. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sharon Price. I'm with the Cloudburst Consulting Group and uh, been working on issues around homelessness and education. And I'm wondering what more the Department of Education can do uh, to play in this. There's one wonderful but lonely guy who works on homelessness at the Department of Education. And it, it seems like there's a real disconnect uh, between the communication and just the ability to um, get kids to school, so transportation issues. Um, there's these liaisons that are paid for, but a lot of times the trickle down to the actual schools, they don't even know that they're in that role. It's maybe a tenth of their time. So I'm wondering what else can be done. Sure, I'm gonna assume that's a question for me. <laughs> um, she's probably right. So I think that it is true that from the Federal Department of Education standpoint, um, our kind of direct levers on some of the questions around homelessness are not particularly outstanding for lots of sort of policy and regulatory reasons, but also because simply sort of by nature of our structure and who we deal with, um, that's sort of a little bit outside the bounds. Um, that is not to say, however, that that's not sort of an important question, and I think we have um, taken on, particularly under this administration, a range of new initiatives to try to kind of bridge those worlds. Um, and quite frankly, from our world, we think that is probably better done um, in, in two ways that will seem like we are sort of less visible in this game. One is through partnerships with HUD, and i talk about an example of that. Um, and then the second is really by encouraging schools and school districts to kind of think about how do they bring in kind of a wider range of folks aligned around a common set of goals um, and to give them some resources to do that, but to let them kind of uh, shape that. And so if that means that homelessness is a big issue in their community, that they should be working on that. If that means that healthcare is an issue, um, that they should be looking at a kind of wide range of issues, um, but that they should focus in on the ones that are most pressing and most urgent in their particular communities. Um, so for the, in the first example, um, and Secretary Castro mentioned it earlier, uh, the president announced the first five promise zone um, designations at the beginning of this year, um, and we will um, announce more in the months to come. 
Um, and this is really, the idea behind this is really saying that there are um, a host of federal resources that go towards these particular communities, including ones that focus on homelessness, including ones that focus on education, um, and they are not particularly well aligned. And so the question is sort of, how do we at the federal level help kind of coordinate that, help get out of the way so that people can actually better align those buckets of dollars um, and sort of better leverage each of these different pools so that the whole is essentially kind of greater than the sum of its parts. So it's not additional dollars, but it's um, sort of additional flexibilities and, and some other things sort of attached to that. So I think that's sort of one initiative that's trying to allow communities to sort of take that on directly. Um, and then the other in the latter camp, which sounds similar, but it's actually a completely different thing, is the Promised Neighborhoods Program. Um, and while we have uh, 12 different implementation sites that are implementing kind of this cradle to career continuum that looks at things like homelessness, um, as part of that program, one of the things that we are really heartened by is that we haven't had actually in enough money to fund all of the great applications that we get, but we have actually seen a range of communities across the country kind of take up that framework um, and really use um, kind of local needs and local data to figure out where they should best focus their efforts um, and a host of private funders that have also stepped in to support that as well. Last question. Oh my gosh. Okay. My name is Jean Green Dorsey, and I wanted to address the issue about the schools. I live in Manhattan, and I live in what was a former Mitchell Lama that is now a luxury building. But PS 163, which is a public school in our neighborhood, did manage to meet some of the goals that you're talking about in terms of the newly um, more affluent younger people who had children and the question is do you send them to public school or do you pay 20000 to send them to second and third grade? And we had a good coterie of people coming into our public school. We had uh, AP classes, we had English as a second language. We effectively turned our school that is 60 to 70 percent minority into a magnet school for those kids. But there's always a balance. And, and just when you think you got a handle on the universe, they now want to try and build because the property is so valuable from a real estate standpoint. They want to put a 20 story building uh, right smack up against the school. Now, if you got a choice and your kid is not going to be going to a school where they're going to be drilling and building and put up something that's going to put a shadow over the whole darn building. So you can do it. I mean, we made a magnet school out of 163. And um, the parents that are there who are supporting the kids, the middle class kids, are working very well with everybody else. And it's just like in my building where I, we live now. Um, the apartment across the hall is four times my rent. But it doesn't mean that we're not good neighbors. Mm -hmm. It just means that we got to do some fighting. And well, yeah, we do do some fighting. The fighting is they didn't want me to use the gym, so I'm suing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. But this kind of thing can be done, and for school, because housing does matter. Um, I, I think one of the things that makes me feel proudest about the fights is that I live in a building where there are people that have regular jobs and their kids are going to Annapolis, they're going to Yale, they're going to wherever they want to go because of the st stability, because of the foundation, because poor people need respite too. So if your kid gets out and things don't go well, you need a place you can come back to. And it's important. So thank you so much fighting. for your commitment to this work. Um, we are just at time, but I do want to just pause um, and quickly see if there's anything really burning, kind of closing comments of stuff that we haven't touched on from any of our panelists. I would just add one, one thing. Um, the idea of looking at pre-K, early childhood is a new sexy, I guess, in America right now. But we're forgetting a huge population of, of, of kids before they come to school, uh, from, from prenatal care all the way up. So nurse family partnership programs like that are great partners between HUD and, and, and school systems of city. So addressing those populations before they become school age, I think is something we've got to focus on as well. Right. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists for joining us today and for their outstanding commitment to this work.